previously on Balls. And uh, now time to catch up with our very special guest. Have we spoken to you uh, on, the, on the radio station yet? Um, no, on not balls. yet. No, no. Not balls yet. Visual Radio. No, yeah, not, not yet. yet. Okay, well, welcome for the first time. Thanks. And as a special uh, welcome, what we've done is we've got, uh, we've got Jason Hartman here just to uh, revise a classic Beatles song. Quickly, I, I, I'm surprised no one ever did this song for you, Penny. I don't know. Adjusted <laughs> the words and decided. It's a very short version, and we'll work on something fuller. But anyway, are you ready, Jase? Oh, do you need the lyrics? Sorry. Last time at our golf day, we gave him the lyrics on the iPad, and he's saying, send from my iPad as well. <laughs> uh, all right, there we go. I think they're all ready. There we go. Do you, yeah, just, I yeah. thought you'd remembered them. I all just right. remember the Penny Haynes. Okay. Well, that's, that's the it. first line. So here we go, then. See how this sounds. It's done to the Beatles' Penny Lane. It's Penny Haynes, she's on our show and here at the Dross. She lives, she lives just down the road so she can't get lost. It's great to have you here. There we go. <laughs> Well done. Hey, how's that? Eh? Thanks. I think we should get a full version of that Penny Lane song, especially for Penny. Uh, Jason, that was your biggest applause of the afternoon. Yeah, big end. That's thanks to uh, you know the man for the for the lyrics. Yeah. Thanks. And your most and your most popular performance at our golf day was that thank you song as well for our sponsors. Uh, uh, wings set our hearts on fire. <laughs> Said from my iPad. Said from my. iPad. All right, cool. We'll hear from Jason again in a short while. Welcome, nice to have you here, nice to see you again, looking very well. Thank you, Darren, good to see you too. You still live down the road here, right? Yeah, yeah, right pretty at the end of the, uh, I'm not going to give you a address. I end of the stalkers. long road, yeah. Yeah, uh, you've been there a long time now, eh? Yes. Yeah, cool. Okay, let's not give away where Penny stays. <laughs> and what are you up to? A lot of traveling. Okay. Um, in the last two years, started doing, getting back to the water. Started oh, really? doing swim clinics, yeah. Come back? Okay. No, 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 not, not a comeback. I well, haven't been in the shape. water myself. You're in good shape to make a comeback. Is it, you're, looking, eh? you're looking very well. <laughs> I don't know, when you... When you were a professional athlete and you retire, you feel your age a lot more. Is it? Yeah. So back in the water coaching? No, just uh, doing swim clinics, so okay. more the motivational psychology side of it and then looking at the mechanics of strokes. So, so basically the aspects that the coaches don't have the time to attend to. All right. So is this now with kids uh, or is this with our Ranging, professionals as No, well? it ranges. They are, we look up to from level one to level three. A few senior swimmers have done the course. Mm. But in general, it's more, like I say, looking at the basics and, and correcting. And, of course, our senior swimmers, there are some of our gold medalists that mm -hmm. could use some help on their stroke. Okay. Um, <laughs> Jeez. You mean they could do better? Which ones? No, I think I've said it enough as well. I think Chad did a great job, but if you look at his technique, he could improve so much more, which actually is not an insult. It's a compliment because it means that there's immense potential for him in four years' time. Have you spoken to him? Yeah, he knows it. He says it himself. Okay. Yeah. But have you spoken to him? Since his gold medal yeah. performances. No, we've only tweeted. Okay. So He's you, a busy man these days. He is a busy man these days. You, <laughs> to get, you speak to Bert to get to chat. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that, I mean, just going back to that Olympic Games, that was an, uh, I mean, I don't think people, we've been talking about this in this country, I don't think South Africans sometimes realize some of the things we've achieved in sport here. Uh, we're talking about Jacques Cullis and just what he's achieved as a, as a cricketer mm -hmm. and that maybe we haven't really sort of given him the accolades he deserves because... He's undoubtedly, if not one of the greatest cricketers that, that's ever walked this planet. Uh, I think he's our, one of our greatest sportsmen, if I'm not our greatest sportsman of all time, just from what he's achieved. Chad beating Michael Phelps. I don't yeah. know if South Africans really understand exactly what that meant. It's a great achievement, but, you know, it goes two ways. I think on the one hand, for Chad, he swam with heart. He's, he's an incredibly hard worker. He's definitely put in the miles and I think mentally strong. As I said, his technique, if you compare to Michael, is not so great. But then on the other hand, he, he did have a bit of luck on his side in terms of where Michael was at as well. Mm. Um, I think if we're honest... You say Michael sort of on, over well, past his pinnacle and... No, was... no, I just think, well, there's this whole story between 2004 and 2008. Michael never missed, I think he missed four days in the four years. Not just training days, total. So he trained when no one else was willing to train. Mm. Between tw 2008 and 2012, he missed over 200 workouts. So okay. he certainly wasn't as focused. But I think what came into play is no one had beaten him for a decade in the 200. Mm. So when the 200 came along, I think in his mind, when he turned for the last 50, it was clear he was a, a half a body length ahead of Chad. He must have thought no one's going to catch him. Mm. So if there was ever a race that wasn't a concern, it was the 200. And of course, Chad came out of nowhere with some great heart. And the irony is that he out-touched the guy who is probably the greatest finisher in the world. 
All right. Now, what you said about Chad and the fact that he can get better, I mean, that bodes well in, in one way. That bodes awesomely for us because I think, what, he's got another three Olympic Games maybe in him? No, two? I'd say, I'd say two. two. Yeah. But on the other side of it, because of what he's achieved now, we also know how, sort of, how demanding South Africans are, and you'll know this from when you won your gold, that um, you don't want him to end up with that missing 200 days in the pool going to the next Olympics because that's kind of, I think, they, they're fighting that battle at the moment. I think the challenge is... Uh, on the one end, to handle the fame, to maximize every opportunity that comes his way now as a result of his um, great performances, and at the same time still keeping a level head and, and being as diligent in the swimming pool in his workouts as he's always been. And they, you know, that is on the one hand the demands of the time that, uh, that, co that the public and sponsors will make, but on the other hand just his own motivation. And then, of course, to go back to the Olympics and repeat as a medalist is one of the hardest things to do. And as we've seen Chad come along, there's always these other people that are going to come up. So a lot of challenges lying ahead. Yeah, you don't know who's going to be there in four years or eight years' time, I suppose. Uh, Cameron? I think Cameron is a different kind of swimmer if you compare the two. Cameron is a little older. Um, and I think in terms of his swimming, he's taken charge of it. It's a personal thing for him. He doesn't have a coach like Graham in, in terms of Chad that has Graham on pool deck. So Cameron's been a very intellectual swimmer. He's really been analytical about his stroke and his technique. There's very little that he can improve. I think right now he's got the fastest turnover on, of any breaststroke swimmer ever in the history of swimming. Having said that, um, him along with all the other male breaststrokers have bent the rules a little bit. So if Fina comes in with a couple of rule changes, depending on which way it goes, it could either be an advantage to them or it might be a bit of a setback. Does that include the turn as well? Yeah, I'm talking about those kicks off the wall. Mm. Um, but I think it's a difficult thing. I think it's not, they bent the rules, but at the same time, FINA opened the door for that in, in the changing of the rules initially. So there's yeah. a lot to be discussed around that point. That wasn't around in your day? No, no, no. The, that, that rule change came about in 2003. Okay. Mm. All right, now let's turn our attention to our, our, uh, our female swimmers, our ladies, and, um, and their performance at the Olympic Games. Were you disappointed or you think it's not our time yet? No, I think there's a number of things to be considered over there, but I think the highlight for me personally was Suzanne von Billion. I think people don't really realize how well she did, aside from the fact that she broke my record. The fact is she retired two years after, well, she retired 40 years after the last Olympics, so she's had a very short build-up to these Olympic Games, and having done her best performances ever, it sets her up to continue to improve, provided she can also retain that motivation. The problem we have is that the support from federations and SASCOC and such is not always there to the degree that we need it. And I think as the swimmers get older, we seem to see, to see a tendency that the Federation wants to support the younger swimmers and not so much the more senior swimmers like the Rollins and perhaps even Suzanne going forward. All right, because, I, I mean, it's, it's going to be a constant battle with, uh, with South Africa is trying to get the funds. We saw what, what, what Britain have done with their Olympic team as a mm -hmm. whole and, and all their sports. They've, they've realized that you've got to put the resources behind it, no matter if it's a high-profile sport or one of the smaller ones, and they're paying dividends, and they started this probably eight years ago, Correct. building up to this. Um, do you see us ever getting to that point? I think what we're talking about in terms of London, or the UK team, is typical of any host nation for the Olympic Games. We saw the same in 2000 with the, with the Australians in the Sydney Games. So I don't know that South Africa will ever be in that position. If it were to be that we ever hosted the Games, perhaps, then there'd be an influx of um, funding and support. But we first got to get rid of the politics in our various federations. Do you see us hosting the Olympics? And you know, if so, what, how, what time and where? I think if we ever were to host it, it can only be Durban. I think one of the unique things about Durban is that if, if we were to host the Olympic Games, we'd be the only country ever in the history thus far to be able to host all of the disciplines within the same, uh, let's say, precinct, yeah. including the village and the housing. Mm. But having said that, I don't know that it would be a good idea for South Africa. It's great. Um, for the duration of the games, it's great for those sporting codes, but then afterwards it would be the same scenario as we see, but probably even worse than we see right now with our stadiums. Mm. I don't think there would be the sustainability and, and the same use of those facilities as you see in other countries. And um, I, I just struggle to think that it would be a wise decision. And also, I think a headline just in the last week about the World Cup costing us $27 billion. Was it rand or dollars? I'm not quite sure. But I they mean, ran. that scares people, you yeah. know, especially in this day and age where... You know, everybody's battling economically that uh, if we start looking at Olympic Games, okay, things might have turned around by then. 
um, unless the Mayans are right, in which case <laughs> we got nothing stuff to worry about. We, we've anyway. had the last Olympics was London, and there it is. So yeah, <laughs> spend all your money as much as you can, and whatever you've got, spend it, and don't worry about your bank overdraft. Um, but yeah, I mean that might scare a few people as as well. So uh, who knows? Um, and just overall, I mean, just our Olympic performance as well as a, as a as a country. Do you think we should be getting more medals? I think by now we should be building on it. We should be getting more. I would think, especially in sporting codes such as, uh, I think boxing for one. I can't fathom why we don't use our world champions, the Baby Jakes and and um, and the other great boxers that we've had in the past, and use them to build our teams. Federations. Yeah, of course. Mm. Um, and and so too, I think. I would have imagined we would have built in the track and field events as well. It seems like we have some athletes that do really well, and it's, it should jump start the sport, and then it doesn't. It dies out and then moves on, of course. Yeah. I mean, you talk about boxing. It's a perfect example. We, you get to a scenario where your boxing, your South African boxing uh, scenario or, or scene cannot even populate a top ten. Yes. South African boxers. You've got a champion, and then you might only have four in some divisions. Yeah. Now... These these guys that are coming through the ranks as Olympians and amateurs are the ones that should be populating that. So Boxing South Africa should be looking at everybody coming through yes. and, and embracing them and giving them the resources so that they can go through an Olympic Games, giving them that support, but then also become our professional champions in time to come. But, I mean, it's few and far between. And, as I say, you always go back to who's running uh, whichever sporting discipline in this country. And it's, it's a common theme, it seems, in this country is that they don't... And I don't want to speak about myself. Take myself out of the equation. But let's look at boxing then. They don't use Brian and they don't use Baby Jakes and they don't use the others. And those are the people that should be speaking with these younger boxers and helping them and grooming them. Um, so too in track and field they should be using our various champions from the past and in swimming also. But you don't see that happening. Awesome. So Penny's got one of the, I don't know if you still got the same Christmas, she's got one of the most awesome Christmas trees I've seen. No, it really does. I don't think I've taken it out since. You <laughs> left it up the whole time. That was like 2005. It's, it's been in storage. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't taken it out again. No. I think I'm away most show. Christmas. Yeah, yeah. It's really it's just for your show. No, like now I'm off to um, Istanbul, the World Short Course Swimming, and okay. I've got some meetings for FINA. I'm on the Athletes Commission. And then uh, just basically uh, um, this, this year I'll be spending some time with my family. So... There's no need for a Christmas tree. And family in KZN, where were they? Well, all over the show right oh, now. My brothers are out of country most of the year, so okay. we, we will make a plan. We haven't decided yet where. Awesome. Well, listen, we appreciate you coming through. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Thanks a lot, Dan. Appreciate your time, and uh, you're looking very well. You're Thank one you. of our favorite sports people. Thank you. So uh, hopefully we'll catch up with you again sometime on okay. the show soon. Thanks, Thank Penny. you. Good luck. Bye. Penny Haynes, South African uh, swimming legend, joining us here at the Dross in Vartokluf. This is... Balls Visual Radio. Darren, Simon, Kate and John. Weekdays from 3pm to 6pm Central African Time. Balls.co.za